Okay, hello everybody, how you doing? And welcome to the live stream. I'm Stephen Bauman, and today I'm gonna to be sketching a skull. I hope that all of you got your drawing materials out or your second screen and uh, Photoshop open or your iPads with Procreate or whatever it is so that you can chat, uh, so you can um, sketch along with me. I just wanna take care of a couple of little admin bits and pieces. Um, if you are interested in like in-depth portraiture tutorials and stuff like that, you can visit my website, stephenbaumanartwork.com. There's tons of like free material there. So, so check it out if you get the chance. But without further ado, I'm gonna switch to the second screen where I have my source image and my um, canvas ready to, to kind of start sketching and get to some of the questions that you guys have already started to type in. Hello then. All right, so um, let's see. I think we're like ready to uh, to roll. Uh, like I said, I've got a few questions. Um, I think already um, already in from uh, from a couple of people. One of them was, how do you kind of keep a sense of breadth in a drawing? Now, this is a tricky question because we need to say like, well, breadth in general then is. Um, is just a quality of kind of openness uh, or, um, you know, non-specificity. Like you want a drawing that kind of shows up as being, um, well, yeah, this is where it gets tricky because you have this all this uh, kind of stuff to define about uh, vocabulary and things, right? So um, I think that in general, I find keeping a drawing like broad and open is actually a lot easier with... Um, like traditional materials than uh, than I find it with um, with like uh, uh, digital materials like I'm kind of drawing on Photoshop now uh, but oh by the way I just want to mention as well like um, while I'm drawing I'm gonna try and like look over and see all the comments but probably I'm going to uh, miss some of them uh, but let's let's do a shorthand answer right so how do you uh, how do you keep uh, or maintain a sense of breadth in your drawing uh, well, for starters, you stay away from detail. I mean, and, and how do you do that? That's a little bit more of a kind of complex uh, problem. But eventually, um, I think it comes uh, a little bit with understanding like what great block-in concepts are, if that makes sense, right? So, um, you know, each stage of the drawing has its own like kind of needs and the own, its own like things that it can do for you. Uh, and as you begin to kind of practice those more and more, you're going to get better at kind of anticipating what you can do in each stage. And that is the way that for me, uh, I tend to maintain a, a, a sense of breadth in, um, in my drawings. Hope that helps. Uh, somebody else was asking, I'm just going to switch over to the uh, comments really quick. Because um, there was one I, I didn't want to miss. Uh, yeah, so Kevin Mann asks, uh, when drawing the head, do you think of the skull structure and muscle structure while constructing the image. Yeah, absolutely, I do, you know, and this is, I think, the interesting thing to um, understand about, like, how anatomy and things kind of make their way into your uh, your work, you know, because we're not really, um, or at least I'm not really trying to make uh, just a uh, an anatomical drawing. I would like to make like a good drawing that that has obviously uh, anatomical themes present within it and that those anatomical themes are going to help me to kind of maintain a sense of like uh, uh, structure and, and design within the drawing. Um, so with that in mind, right, uh, you know, anatomy is this thing where, you know, for me, um, it's kind of a, a compass rather than a roadmap. Uh, this is like a, a metaphor I was using with a student of mine uh, just yesterday. I was doing some uh, mentorship meetings. Um, and like I said, you know, like anatomy is not, uh, I mean, in this case, by the way, we're drawing the skull. So anatomy is a little bit <laughs> what we have to, to deal with. Uh, but um, when you're drawing like a portrait proper, like let's say I have a portrait commission or something like that, um, you know, it's not an anatomy contest. Uh so you kind of just take the anatomy where you find it uh, rather than trying to like force it into the um, 
force it into the picture. At least that's how I tend to kind of think about it, right? So that um, so that I don't get kind of caught up in, uh, you know, the kind of facial muscles and things when I'm kind of meant to be uh, drawing a, a beautiful impression of um, uh, of the model or the subject that I'm working with. Uh, then MJ was asking also like what um, uh, I started a site a while back called Atelier Forum and MJ was asking uh, what I intend to kind of do with that or do about that. I'm not sure like really because I started Atelier Forum to um, just act as a place where I could kind of put ideas that I really didn't know what to do with and so uh, I think it kind of still is that. So I've really kind of commuted most of what I would do on Atelier Form actually onto stephenbaumanartwork.com. Um, so right now, you know, I really, I don't have any idea what uh, what I'm doing with Atelier Form. So that's the uh, the answer to that one. Uh, there's a bunch of questions that have come in and um, uh, I've missed a few of them here, but let me just dive in. Uh... Abjit asks, what should be learning process of art to become a professional? Well, this is a kind of cool question because you're kind of making that distinction between um, like education in terms of what you need to learn about drawing and education in terms of what you need to learn about being an artist. Uh, you know, and, and I've never seen something that was a comprehensive like become a professional uh, kind of training um, you know a lot of people have maybe weighed in or put in their two cents about um, about what it takes to kind of be a professional uh, I think that you know uh, certainly acquiring the skill necessary uh, and the practice necessary to produce work at the level that you're trying to produce it at uh, obviously is uh, is the beginning, but that's really only a part of what you need to, um, I think, be a professional artist, uh, you know, and that's why what makes this, I think, such a good question is that it's really kind of open ended right now. In addition to that, I think what it takes to be a professional artist has probably changed a lot in the last uh, even 10 years, I would say. It's massively, uh, massively different. I think when I was a student going through, you know, we all kind of looked up to the um, instructors when, and they were like, you know, they were showing at whatever XYZ gallery and, um, you know, they'd, uh, they'd sell a painting uh, here and there and that was like life. Uh, and most of what you had to do was just kind of left to the... Um, the gallery professionals that you are working with rather than like anything that you're doing yourself nowadays you know we all know it's really it's quite different isn't it uh, nowadays artists are all on like social media many of them are like just selling their work themselves which i think you know personally i think is like a great idea you know one of the most frustrating things uh, i found about being a professional artist was just having to wait on people you know um and, and I've worked with some very nice galleries and very effective galleries. And that's that's obviously what you want to, to do when you have that relationship. But even so, you know, I'm a very much like kind of a self-starter in that sense that I, I like to uh, kind of be in control of um, of these aspects of my of my career. And I, I always felt it very frustrating that um, uh, that I just had to kind of wait on people, send paintings away and just uh, um, wait and wait and wait kind of perpetually. Uh, so I found it really frustrating. And um, uh, as a product, I tried to kind of create a career for myself where like I was responsible for how it, how it, it you know, it, if it rises or falls, you know, it's kind of on me. Um, and uh, that's the kind of the way I prefer it. So I think that, you know, understanding like part part of, you know, the, the whole being a professional artist things, understanding like actually what you're doing, right? Because you're essentially running a small business. And I think you want to just make peace with that fact rather than I think, uh, you know, what what can happen a lot of times is we we get into this phase where we try to like separate, you know, art making from our career. 
and you know it's it's not really that way i think they are a little bit more intertwined than that so um, i say that we we kind of just take into account here's what's happening i'm an artist i'm uh, also like a sole proprietor for my own um, for my own business uh, you start to do that and then i think many things become possible because you're taking control of the um, uh, of the situation and probably chief among the things that you really want to do is is really start building an audience in order to build an audience though you do need to and this is like this is critical right you know uh, um, let's say you know a question i get all the time is like what um you know uh, you know how do you kind of like become popular on instagram or or one of these like kind of social networks how do you become popular on these uh, on these channels well I think a big part of that is just understanding like what your value is, like what can you offer to the people that are going to be following your page? Because in some ways, it's it's not really about you, you know, it's about them. They they're following you because of something that you can do for them, not 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 something that they can do for you. And um, I think embracing that idea is uh, is the beginning of. Uh, of like finding a way to to find your niche or your audience um, on on social media it's just kind of like taking your own uh, ego out of it a little bit you know and and just trying to figure out um, why why should somebody follow you really I guess is the is eventually the question right I hope that if that helps it's a little bit of a uh, um, uh, a little bit of a digression but uh, hopefully uh, hopefully a good one um, by the way, I hope that my sound is working all right. I'm pretty sure it is. If anybody, if it's not, then just uh, kind of let me know. Um, another question from, uh, let's see, Joe says, what happened to the Atelier Forum podcast? Love the one episode that's on YouTube. The Atelier Forum podcast. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good question. Uh, the Atelier Forum podcast uh, was something that I was doing um, that has been eventually replaced by the what we love about podcast, right? So I just found that eventually the format of what we love about was something I was a little bit more interested in because uh, it meant that I could, I wasn't having to kind of like rely on other people to schedule with. Um, I could just kind of make my own episodes uh, whenever I needed to. And so that is what happened to it. Um, it is uh, still there in a sense in a different form. It's just kind of me talking about our work and really we'll be doing the same thing like, you know, if you talk about like uh, uh, the what we love about series, you know, it's not it's not just based on like artists alone. Uh, there's also the um, like we could talk about what we love about, you know, different, you know, brush types, you know, so it's it's that open ended and uh, we can really kind of do a lot uh, a lot with it. So that's where it is. Uh, let's see other questions that have uh, that have been coming in. Uh, Nick DeLuca asks, when painting, if you have a large flat area with no shadows, like on the cheek, what are some of the things to do to add interest? That's kind of a cool one, uh, and one that's also like really close to my heart in a sense, in that, you know, big, you know, because all right, yeah, here's the thing. Sorry, <laughs> let me digress. Uh, yeah, like large kind of unbroken areas of value, like, for instance, like the background here, it, it is monotonous, it is boring, there's not really uh, um, much of anything to it. So if you encounter that in a painting, you know, what do you do? How do you how do you make that kind of an interesting uh, place for the for the viewer's eye to be? I think then usually about kind of, you know, visual textures uh, is the way that I tend to want to solve that, right? So rather than uh, um, uh, just kind of like painting it as flat as like the, uh, you know, uh, a painting of a wall or whatever, we can kind of look to adding, you know, micro texture. So basically like a micro texture would be something like what we have uh, over here, where when you squint down and look at like this area um, uh, on the back of a the skull, there's a couple different values present, but they kind of unify together a little bit. So they're not so diverse that they break up the plane, but they, they do offer a little bit of interest. Uh, and so I think that's kind of what you're looking for. You're looking for um, uh, a significant amount of value unity 
Um, but then you can have some interesting stuff happening with color or with uh, um, a little bit of value variation. Um, so a couple different ways that you can uh, um, create a slightly greater sense of interest in, um, in an area like that. Uh, cool question, though. I really like that, uh, that question. Let's see. V Zeta Maru is asking, Stephen, when you're drawing, it seems like you do a lot of searching. I've seen other people advise that you should be sure when you place down your strokes. Can you explain the difference? Um, you know, it's interesting with drawing advice, you know, and I, I, I try my best to, and this is like, this is something also for, for students uh, to always remember, right? Because it's very, you know, all of our assumptions about things are kind of based on what we already know. Uh, and so we can hear things where, you know, it seems like there is some contradiction, right? Uh, um, that you should be sure of where you, you put down your stroke seems uh, contradictory to uh, the idea of kind of like searching when you're, when you're drawing. Um, I think that they're kind of two sides of the same coin. Um, uh, and, and like I said, the advice, you know, that I would like to make for, for students here in general, uh, is try to search for the correlation between things rather than the, uh, the differences. Um, you know, when you, when you hear something that sounds like kind of contradictory, I think you usually want to just try and figure out, uh, actually, is there some correlation that I can understand a little bit better? Um, I say this also because in the schools where, where I would teach, we'd have uh, several different instructors that would all have probably a slightly different take on the same idea. Now, the interesting thing in that uh, is, is actually that it allows you the opportunity to try to make sense of it, right? Because when you're learning about drawing, you're not trying to become like an automaton what you're trying to do is you're trying to like learn about how to think about drawing, right? You hear this saying all the time that uh, you want to like learn how to see. Well, what we're saying really is we're, we're learning how to like understand and interpret what we see. Uh, obviously, all of us can actually see in, in the same way unless you have maybe some like partial color blindness or something, you know, there's some disability then then yeah, that, that changes things. But in general, like when we're talking about learning to see as an artist, we're not talking about physically learning to do something with our eyes. We all, we all see the same thing. We need to understand like how to interpret it. Uh, so when we're talking about like searching versus being a, a certain, I think there's a lot of different uh, ways that I tend to kind of approach work. Now, I find actually that, that painting digitally is I find it in some ways, uh, there, there's some things about it that are harder actually than, than working analog. Uh, it's just by the nature of the, the interface with it, right? Like when I'm working analog, uh, I find my accuracy is much better much sooner, uh, mostly because I have like a great degree of familiarity with the materials um, and also the kind of the procedures that I'm gonna go through uh, are really, really well rehearsed. I've been doing it for, for so many years. Uh, when I'm working digitally, I tend to just um, have a little bit more of like a dive-in approach. It's more like when I was painting when I was younger. I mem remember when I was in my, you know, mid-20s uh, at school and I was studying painting, you know, I would just like go in like all guns blazing, <laughs> just knock in a whole bunch of like color and value and just, uh, you know, see where I'm at at the end of the day. Nowadays, uh, being a little bit older, a little bit more experienced, I, I tend maybe to have a little bit more of a measured approach to, um, uh, to my drawings um, and, and my paintings because I kind of know um, a little bit more the, the value of my, uh, of my time. Um, but as I'm like drawing here with you guys, you know, I think uh, I just tend to to sketch around and let my my pencil or my uh, in this case the the Wacom stylus. I tend to let that just be a bit of a um, uh, you know a bit of a, an exploration of what's uh, what's in the subject, and I think that's totally valuable. I used to teach an anatomy class in uh, well in Sweden, but also eventually in the the U.S. when I worked at the 
the U.S. branch of the Florence Academy. But um, one of the things that I really tried to kind of impress upon my students in that in that class was that your pencil is a tool of kind of discovery. I think we get so caught up in like executing a drawing uh, that we actually kind of confuse you know, drawing as an activity for something that you simply execute. I think there's different kinds of drawing. You know, there are times when I'm drawing when I really just want to discover something that I don't already know. And if I'm really focused on execution, I'm far less likely to discover those things that I don't know. Uh, I'm much more likely to kind of go over a well-trodden path that will lead me to where, like, I need to go. Um, uh, without any uh, difficulty. In exploration, of course, there there is difficulty. So you have this kind of sliding scale between something being uh, efficient and something being kind of more discovery-based. I think there's some quote about, about business where they said like, um, uh, oh gosh, I'm going to butcher it and, and not remember it very well. But effectively, they were setting up like a dichotomy in between uh, research and... Um, and like economic benefit, right? So, uh, or no, you know what it was? It was creativity uh, and, um, and, and like results. So, so if you're in a situation where you have like 100% creativity, your, your outcomes, your results are likely kind of compromised by that. Um, so you'll have less uh, end product, so to speak, uh, because you're just uh, out there in the ether kind of like searching for, um, the interesting new thing. Uh, and there's a time for each one of those. So um, I think if you if you take that advice, uh, that you should always be sure of what you're, uh, you're doing and don't search, be certain of where your your marks are going on the paper. I think that's in a way for one type of drawing, I think that there's a type of drawing where that's highly applicable. Uh, I think there's another type of drawing, however, where if you only go down that well-trodden path, again, you're, you're unlikely to kind of discover uh, new destinations. And uh, sometimes that's exactly what we need is actually to find something that we didn't know was there. And that's gonna mean that we have to um, experiment, we have to, to search. So I hope that helps. That was a really, really long-winded version of, uh, of an answer to that. But, uh, and that means I've also like skipped a whole bunch of questions. Uh, but let's see if I can get some of them. Let's see. Joe is asking. No, that's the same question. Uh, hold on a second. Uh, Art with Aditi is asking, are teachers necessary for learning drawing? You know, I'm not somebody who likes to deal in absolutes. So I would say that, you know, anything is technically possible. But once we say that, we can also understand that some things are more likely than others. Uh, so I do think that having a good instructor is uh, a great accelerant in your, your learning process. So when we're trying to like learn to draw, um, uh, let's see how to put this. We need to like establish, you know, if any of you have learned like a second language out there, right? Think about learning grammar. And think about learning grammar from a teacher who has worked with uh, hundreds of students and is well versed in the trends and tendencies of a student who is trying to learn the grammar of that language. So they've been around the block a few times. They understand very well you know, uh, the typical pitfalls that you can go through. Um, and also they will understand, uh, you know, the things that, that you can avoid to uh, make your life a little bit easier. Then, you know, think of just doing that totally on your own, just looking at a dictionary full of uh, the words of that language and uh, trying to kind of figure it out yourself. I think there's a little bit of an analog there between, you know, being kind of self-taught versus working with a teacher. So uh, nothing in this world, you know, or let's, let's not say that's too extreme, but 
for many things, there are multiple solutions to it. Uh, and you can definitely learn to draw without a teacher. It's totally possible. We know that because, of course, people have done it. I mean, it would be crazy to say that you can't do it without it. I will say, though, that you're likely to experience a lot more resistance if you're doing it on your own. And eventually, and this is actually, I, I think, the hidden cost of, uh, of being self-taught. And, and I know this because, you know, I, I worked for, for quite a while, you know, as a, as a painter before getting a proper education as a painter. You know, insecurity that you feel, you know, as a, as a self-taught artist, I think, I think generally is kind of amplified. Because, you know, I, and this is just speaking about my own experience, you know, not knowing if I was progressing, right? That's a, that's a really difficult, you know, thought or difficult reflection to kind of deal with, right? And if you're out there and you're self-taught, then you know kind of what I'm, what I'm talking about, where you kind of feel like, well... I've just been drawing for like months and I just don't know. I don't have any sense of perspective about like self-criticism and like understanding, you know, where where the, the progress is or is not happening. So uh, just to say, I think that uh, teachers in um, in the best case scenario, teachers are there to assist you in kind of building up the uh, the grammar and the language that you need to become self-sufficient as as an artist right uh, eventually like the goal the eventual outcome for for a teacher is actually that they they will make themselves kind of obsolete right if you are taught really well and you understand very well what you're doing uh, then you eventually in a longer term will not need a teacher at all because you're going to be in your studio uh, alone eventually we're all <laughs> that sounds so nihilistic. Eventually, we're all alone, <laughs> and uh, we're in our studios making the work that we that we wanted to try to to figure out how to make. Uh, and that's the bottom line. And a good teacher should uh, hopefully get you to that place where you're prepared to do that on your own. Uh, right. So, let's see another question. What's more important in a drawing? proportions accuracy or likeness you know i usually try to be really fair to a question and try to answer the the spirit of the question but i think this is one where i'm just gonna have to say like i think that they're all tied up together i don't know if you can separate them in such a convenient way that that one is kind of more important than than the other uh, but let's give it a try anyway, right? My first gut instinct is to say like, no, we just need to consider them them all as equally important because drawings don't exist in a vacuum, right? They they are a part of um, an interrelationship of you know value, design, uh, you know choices, uh, textures, all these things. They're all interwoven. And if one of them is bad or one of them is done badly, it kind of tends to drag the other ones down, right? Like if you have a good drawing that has like, or let's say if you have a drawing that has like a decent sense of design, but like a really bad sense of value, I think that in the same way that like one hand washes the other, the uh, those those poor values are going to distract you, I think, from seeing the design as well as you would like to. Not only as someone like looking at the artwork, but even as somebody that, uh, um, or sorry, not only as the person making the work, but uh, but also as as a person kind of viewing the uh, uh, the work afterwards. But if you had to choose one, like a desert island, you know, <laughs> proportion or what what was the three proportion, accuracy, or likeness. Um, I, th well, wait a minute, those are actually kind of the same things, like proportions and accuracy, I think kind of generally the same thing. And those two things are actually what makes up likeness eventually. So, um, so no, I can't really choose in between those, uh, those three. MJ is asking, what was your process studying anatomy on your own? Yeah, that's, uh, that's an interesting one. Uh, also, because, you know, so many of us are kind of going to be in that in that place you know we're all kind of looking for a good resource online to kind of get us there 
but even even when you have that resource and this is the thing you know about about learning to draw and about learning anatomy and you know you can take this one to the the bank with you right you have to learn to draw the anatomy learning just the idea of anatomy is not learning anatomy for an artist you you want to uh, figure out how to make it a part of your drawing so the uh, most useful thing that you can do when trying to learn uh, anatomy on your own uh, is to make sure that you are sketching enough uh, so your your studies really should primarily consist of making the drawings after that it's about how we kind of augment that uh, that process uh, and about how we um, make that as efficient as possible right so after that i think labeling your your drawings is really important this is something that that was a big part of uh, you know uh, when i was doing this at a, at a proper institution um, a big part of the uh, the process of learning anatomy was labeling it so that you understand that that you have like a um, a a dialogue or a monologue that you can have with yourself about it right when you're looking at your subject you need to be able to say oh well we're looking at the uh, the kind of planes of the frontal bone um, and we're we're looking at the uh, the shape overall of the external orbital apophysis and I'm looking for uh, eventually the um, you know the symmetry in between uh, each side of the skull but you need to know like what those points are for the sake of that symmetry right so I think that eventually labeling all of your work is uh, is really also a kind of quite valuable part of um, uh, of properly studying anatomy um, and and after that I think uh, making sure that you have Ah, yes, yeah, sorry. Um, not sorry, but whatever. Uh, this is the, the, like the next thing that I want to make sure I say uh, is that when you are studying anatomy, try to study it in situ, which is to say uh, you want to be drawing from the human form. Now, that doesn't mean that you need a live model. It's nice if you have a live model, by the way, uh, but that you should find good like anatomy resources that actually allow you to... Um, to study like how the muscles uh, make themselves apparent actually in a um, like in a human right because all of these like anatomical models and even like the really good ones are still like in a sense they're like notional right they are a rendering of what we understand to be there uh, and very often you're going to find that in reality the distinctions in between the muscles of course because of various layers of fat and skin and so on it's not going to be quite as apparent uh, so just learning it again theoretically uh, is not going to guarantee that when you're there like working with a model or trying to make your drawing that you're actually able to uh, um, to find locate and, and, then, and then render all of those forms that you're looking for so soal design is asking how many layers do you make for a digital drawing and do you think it's okay to skew a warp tool for correcting perspectives or fixing proportion i think that you know oh by the way so yeah just quick answers i just use one layer and i actually just treat this as like the most analog thing that i possibly can uh, for me and for what i do and this is really just for me no judgment on on what anybody else wants to do uh, but for me I just want it to be like kind of an analog experience I think that kind of my favorite part of you know working digitally is how it it allows me to kind of communicate with with everybody right so when I'm doing my live workshops you know I love the fact that I have my my Wacom tablet I can pull up multiple slides and I can you know I can communicate so many different ideas so efficiently uh, you know, using the equipment that I have. Uh, and that, of course, a part of that is going to be using Photoshop as well. Um, so, yeah, just for me, it's it's just one layer. And, and again, I use it maybe less as an artist and more as a, as a, as a teacher. Uh, 
is it okay to to do one thing or another thing? I mean, we exist in a, a, a multiplistic universe in which, you know, all things are okay. It just kind of depends upon what your your goals are, right? If you're looking to like learn drawing uh, with an end towards being a really great analog drafts person, then no, probably not, because there's no uh, there's no skewing or perspective fixing tool uh, that you're going to have available to you uh, as an analog artist. Uh, if you're going to be a digital painter, I think that just goes along with the territory. I think I think all digital painters kind of do that as far as I understand it. I mean, I, I don't know, maybe um, I don't know all the digital painters, you know, that are, that are out there, but I imagine that that probably is a fairly common practice to um, uh, to use the advantages um, possible on on Photoshop and so on. Uh, so my guess would be that yeah, it's it's kind of totally okay to do it. That being said, you know what is going to happen is you're going to, I think, create a situation where yeah, your process is a little bit down prioritized. I think like a good drawing process, and this is you know again coming from the analog drawing world um, and, and really aimed at, at that idea. A uh, good drawing process actually shouldn't require a lot of, uh, of kind of major changes. Uh, so what you're trying to do is create a process that very efficiently solves problems, right? And if you're using like uh, other tools to, to fix those problems rather than, than using your your like your process to do it, then then yeah, you're also going to be missing out a little bit on that. So I have no judgment about it. Uh, but just you know, there's going to be different outcomes based on different, uh, I think things that you do. So let's see. Uh, Sudhanshu asks, Oh, wait, I just lost the question because so many other questions popped up. Oh, darn it. Um, Sorry, this is like sparkling commentary here. All right, I want to ask you, which kind of medium in art do you like? Yeah, well, what kind of medium? You know, I kind of span the genres a bit. Like, I think I think I like a lot of different mediums for a lot of different reasons. You know, by the way, I think there's some like amazing, like really transcendent, you know, digitally conceived art out there. So. So for me, even even going into to digital work, I think is, uh, you know, I'm still quite kind of fascinated by as well. So the boundaries are kind of wide open for for me. Um, so I guess it just kind of depends upon like which like which artist we're talking about and, and what I like uh, about that particular artist's work, you know, for oil painting, you know, there's artists that I that I really um, I'm quite fond of. Uh, for what they do with uh, with with oil paint for artists that are drawing, there's there's things that I really love that that artists do in their in their drawings. So um, I don't really say I wouldn't say that I necessarily have a favorite medium. That might be a bridge too far for me to cross. But what is your favorite? I don't know. I mean, maybe I always hear about this, and this would be kind of interesting just to know in general. I always hear that there's like more people in the digital community that are interested in drawing than are interested in, in like oil painting. And I usually see that that kind of bears out, you know, in terms of like YouTube videos and things. When I release a painting YouTube video, it's probably a few less views than there are for like kind of drawing videos. But let me know if you're if that's actually true, that there are more of you interested in drawing or not. I have no idea. So let's see. Um, Someone's commenting on my accent there. It's a weird thing. I can't say uh, Liam Cohen is asking, how are you choosing the direction to hatch for each plane? You know, this, uh, this question I think comes up a lot, uh, you know, in terms of like, how do you hatch uh, from one to the other? I mean, we can start by saying, eventually, it's a highly intuitive process. And there is not at all like an absolute answer to it, you know, and I, I'm if you know, like if you've worked with me before, you watch a lot of my videos or, or whatever it is, then, you know, like I'm not into these kind of like absolute uh, absolutisms because I feel like 
especially in drawing and painting, as soon as you say, this is the way, this is the only way to do it, that's when you find the contradiction. There, there, will, there will immediately be something that, that actually proves that you can do it the other way if you really uh, wanted to. So uh, while I don't prescribe necessarily like a way to, to hatch, uh, I think you know, my practice tends to differ based upon you know, like what I'm, I'm hatching for. Uh, like a lot of times you'll see, like if we talk about the, the cranium, for instance, right? A lot of times I'm hatching like around the edges of that, uh, of that form, or like I'll be hatching along a, uh, a kind of vertical axis to kind of show volume in a particular area, right? And I'm kind of using a, a value that's a little bit too intense here. So I do like to kind of hatch um, along like uh, different axes of, uh, of planes in order to kind of communicate form. I think it's, it can be fairly efficient um, if, you're, if you're doing a drawing that kind of involves a lot of, uh, of cross-hatching. Uh, but you'll also see me like going across a plane like, uh, like this as well. Uh, and that's generally more when I'm just kind of like adding value uh, rather than actually searching out form. So there's kind of two activities going on there. Morris is asking, do you have an opinion on the freedom of tools we have at our disposal today? Do you believe having too many materials might damage us rather than help us in terms of evolving technical skill? Uh, cool question. And it is, I think, one of the primary challenges, uh, you know, for the, the modern student, right? Uh, like all this stuff that's available to us nowadays, like all the, the YouTube videos and everything, you know, when I was going through school like it 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 really just simply wasn't there in in any form that uh, that we would recognize i mean there i'm sure there were people i'm sure that there were people making like drawing videos uh but uh for sure they were far less sophisticated than what they are today so um now i don't think that necessarily having them is a problem the difficulty that it creates is that a lot of the knowledge that you need in drawing and painting is a very deep knowledge, right? Like uh, there's this idea that that information or knowledge is like has this like kind of T-shaped formation, right? Uh, that we can have like a lot of knowledge, uh, uh, a shallow knowledge of a lot of different things, or we can take one thing and kind of drill down quite deeply into it. And this is how you become kind of an expert by drilling down, not by necessarily being like uh, invested in all of these different things. So let's say we watch like 100 different uh, YouTube videos, uh, we get like a little bit out of each one. Uh, let's say we watch one over and over and over again, and we, uh, we draw along with it, or we paint, or we take the same materials, we do research, uh, we, we look to see if there's vocabulary available about it, and you really drill down on, on the information in that video, I think then you gain more from it. So I think the challenge or the difficulty for a lot of students right now is that there being so much available out there to you to experience, as soon as you hit any kind of resistance, it's very easy to just like jump over to the next thing, right? Like so resistance essentially is just difficulty. So I start drawing my first head, and it's not that good. Uh, so that's that's resistance, right? And unless I press through that and I practice, you know, a dozen more, I'm not going to get much better. But if I say like, oh, there's resistance, and then I just go, I'm just going to start drawing this other thing over here. I'm going to draw a tree, or I'm going to draw hands, or I'm going to draw whatever. You know, that that creates that difficulty of not really drilling down on a subject. So MJ is asking, what were the evening classes like in Florence? Uh, so when I was uh, let's. I'll clarify also the question for everybody who uh, may not have the context for it. Um, I studied painting and drawing in Italy, in, in Florence, at a school called the Florence Academy. And uh, eventually, they also opened a campus in Sweden, where my wife and I also taught at that campus. And they also eventually opened a campus in the USA, and we also taught at that campus. So uh, the question really is, what were evening classes like at the Florence Academy? What were they about? 
and eventually our evening classes were split into several different groups. My anatomy course was an evening class, right? So after six hours uh, in the daytime of uh, drawing or painting, students would uh, have uh, an hour long break before they would begin an evening course that would be either anatomy or, um, or figure drawing. So the figure drawings that we would do in the evening were quite a bit more rapid than the ones that we do during the day. So during the daytime, a lot of times students would be doing drawings that would, uh, they'd have about like 75 hours to, with the model to, to make a drawing. Um, and in the evening, you'd have about two hours. Uh, so you'd be doing like a quicker linear pencil sketch uh, of a model uh, as opposed to the much longer form um, designs that you would do during the uh, during the day. So that's what we're about. They were just about like slightly faster um, studies, you know, keeping the, the, the mind and the hand very active, but in a slightly different way, you know. Um, so there was much more emphasis on uh, on like line drawing, for instance, like when I taught evening, by the way, <laughs> when I taught evening class, there was a lot more emphasis on line drawing. Florence Academy in general is not really a line drawing school, uh, or at least not in any very serious capacity during the time that, that I was there, I think. Uh, it's much more of a mass drawing school, right? They'd prefer you to be drawing in charcoal and in masses and... Um, and to engage with uh, form and representation in that way. Very efficient way, by the way. Um, this is not uh, me like um, saying, oh, we should do this or should do that. But I love line, and I think the language of line is very dynamic and very interesting. So uh, when I taught those evening classes, I would take my uh, liberty to, um, to focus a little bit more on the properties of line drawing and how they can help us understand form very well. But let's uh, go to the next uh, question here. So um, Mike Hendley is asking, sitting in our woods right now, feeding the birds and watching this, it's a good morning. It's not so much a question, but uh, but just like a nice uh, chill vibe to uh, to watch some uh, some live sketching with. Um, uh, really nice. And Mike Hendley, uh, if that is the Mike Hendley that uh, I'm thinking of, has a really chill podcast that you should check out. Um, I think, I don't know, you'd have to just look for Mike Hendley. I don't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but I know my wife was on the podcast, really had a great time uh, recording it with, uh, with Mike. I think eventually uh, I'll also be on that podcast. Just need to find the time to uh, get that done. Let's see. Kevin Mann asks, do you think about layers in your process? Well, yeah, I mean, um, layers in my process... Uh, let's say my analog process, because I think probably most of you will know me as as an analog. I, by the way, in my distinction, analog is just I'm talking like actual physical paintings, not uh, digital paintings. Um, uh, I do nominally paint digital paintings, but I'm not. You wouldn't confuse me for being a digital artist. You know, I think those guys uh, and girls out there are really crushing it. Um, but uh, but it's not really a thing that I um. I have the skill set for uh, so but you know when I'm making oil paintings uh, then absolutely totally 100% I do think about uh, about layers and in fact I found that over the years what is really important when I'm making an oil painting is that I have a kind of uh, not quite a deadline but I have like some boundaries on on my my time to figure out what I'm supposed to be doing, right? So when you're painting and drawing, you're up against like the boundaries of your ability, right? Your your capacity to actually make something look the way that it looks uh, is, you know, uh, uh, it has levels. And I find that for me, after about three passes on an oil painting, uh, I should have been able to, now there's no guarantee, but I'm gonna say I should have been able to express what I am able to express about the subject. Uh, which is not to say that after three uh, layers, I have a great painting every time. But usually I have um, used my skills, my abilities, my experience to get to a certain place uh, uh, with that oil painting. And, uh, and that's the time that it, that it should take in general. 
Now, I might spend more time on the painting. I might take like a fourth layer, but that's the point at which I'm trying to like kind of push myself into like a new boundary to a new place that I maybe haven't been before, right? Uh, so that's kind of what I'm thinking about in terms of, of oil painting and, uh, and layers and kind of pacing myself in that respect. Um, for students, it can be a little bit different. I think you probably want to give yourself like a few more layers. Uh, you know, sometimes it can be even healthy to just say, you know, this is kind of an open-ended painting. Like, I'm just going to paint it until I feel like I get it right. That is, however, then important that, that probably you would have a teacher kind of helping you out because you know, at a certain point, you kind of lose perspective. And I know we've all been there, like with our own artwork, where you just, you just can't see it anymore. You just don't know if what you're looking at is good, bad, or otherwise. Um, and you need some kind of like input, you know, some even community input, you know, even if it's just uh, colleagues of yours. Uh, but uh, very valuable then to get expert opinions if, uh, if that's ever possible for you. Um, I hope that kind of answers the question. I know I digressed a little bit. Let's see. So MJ is asking, um, what is MJ asking? What about being a self-taught artist while also studying on your Patreon? Uh, well, I think it's, I think, obviously, I think it's a good idea. You know, I, I try to make the, the content as, as valuable and, and kind of rich as possible and uh, uh, try to make as much of it as possible accessible. You know, and this is the the other thing too, and this kind of goes into my um, uh, that explanation I was making about kind of drilling down on subjects. That, you know, I think seeing the breadth of of my work and and all the different kind of projects that I bring to Patreon, I think each one kind of helps inform the other. So you can see my drawing process, you can see my painting process, and you can see the kind of differences and similarities in between each one. And I think actually that really is super valuable uh, so that we can understand like how one is influencing the other because it's highly likely that when you're an artist, you're not just going to be an artist who draws or just going to be an artist who paints. You're, you're highly likely to engage in, in each one of those. And you know, understanding how they cross over, how they, they kind of cross pollinate. I think that's really fascinating. So uh, if you're studying like on my on my Patreon um, and you're you're kind of self-taught, I think I think in a way maybe that's going to be like on the boundary of like self-taught uh, because really you are getting educational content that's like coherent and holistic. So uh, not that it's, you know, the same as studying at, um, you know, at a, at a three year atelier, but I think, I think probably you're on the border of being able to call it self-taught, especially if you're in like the mentorship group where, um, where, uh, yeah, I work with you one-on-one -on -one. and also now the other thing that I'm doing as well, and I'm really, really proud of is the live workshops. So I'm developing like what is, uh, what I'm calling basically a curriculum live. So this is going to be me basically trying to uh, create a um, kind of start to finish conception of uh, of like atelier based education, uh, but for a series of online workshops uh, so that students can kind of have access to not only like good demos and good information, but uh, can can also get that sense of going through a program right that's designed to help them at kind of each level with the kind of difficulty that they'll be facing at that level like beginner problems are not the same as like third year student problems and so they require maybe a slightly different kind of coaching at a, at a different level and that's the essence of what is going to be going on in curriculum live which is really is just a uh, an extension of your Patreon subscription. So if you are subscribed uh, at the $10 level, then then you have access to that all automatically. So anyway, um, <clears throat> I think that as long as you're doing the work uh, and uh, especially if you're in a place where you have the opportunity to have like um, consistent uh, advices or consistently designed projects, you know, uh, I think that part of the self-taught problem is that you probably like just bounce around 
in between like a lot of different philosophies, a lot of different visual approaches. Uh, and so you don't get to kind of drill down. I think if you're somewhere where you're drilling down and you're getting consistent um, uh, uh, demos and things, then I think it's a little bit different. <clears throat> let's see. Uh, let's see. Jamie uh, Gertler is asking or saying that I love Vermilion Extra and Yellow Brown. Uh, I love the palette of Flake White Alizarin Vermilion and Yellow Brown. It's perfect. What was the utilization of it? Trial and error. Ah, yo, uh, so like she's talking uh, about my oil painting palette and how did I get to using those exact colors? Yes, it's very much trial and error, and they're very specific to the pigments available, right? So the question I get a lot, because a couple of those pigments are, are rather expensive, like Vermilion Extra is like a, quite an expensive pigment if you buy a tube of it, like say from Old Holland. Because uh, we're talking about like genuine Vermilion, we're not talking about like a Vermilion Hue. The reason that I use really everything on that palette is, is actually about balance and tinting strength. So it's not something that we really face in digital painting at all. Uh, and I think is one of the major kind of dividing lines in between the two disciplines uh, in terms of like execution uh, is that oil paint is a kind of, uh, is literally like a fluid substance, but also in terms of how you mix the color, you do it fluidly, right? It's about how different proportions of pigments mixed together with different proportions of other pigments and so and it also depends a little bit like on on uh, um, you know, like how much medium you have in in your mixtures and also like what brands that you have will have different tinting strengths so there's a lot of different variables in color mixing when it comes to oil paint uh, so that palette the reason i use yellow brown for instance instead of yellow ochre is that yellow ochre is a very low tinting strength pigment right it's just a basic kind of earth pigment and it does not tint very strong at all so let's say you mixed up equal proportions of like alizarin crimson and yellow ochre you'd have a mixture that was vastly more red than it was yellow uh, so this would be to me like a slightly problematic relationship in terms of like palette harmony it's not one that you can't overcome, but my palette is arranged in such a way that I have pigments that tint equally. So yellow brown is quite a bit more transparent than yellow ochre and also has a much stronger tinting strength. And so I'm able to, uh, I think, balance a little bit better between a pigment like alizarin crimson, a pigment like uh, genuine vermilion. Uh, and uh, uh, so I have like a little bit more uh, ease in, in the actual painting process kind of because of that. Uh, so that's really what it's about. And I used, you know, a lot of different pigments. You know, I tried ochres from different companies and uh, uh, tried different kind of combinations of pigments. But this is like eventually the uh, happy medium, like the harmonious place that I ended up was with those pigments that I, that I now recommend, which, uh, again, I think they're kind of the perfect balance. <laughs> yeah, so good question there. Let's see. Let's see. Oh, no. A lot of questions popped in. Hold on. Hold on. Uh, I'm not going to get to all these questions, guys. There's a lot of them. And uh, so uh, for, forgive me in advance, please, for not uh, not getting to all of them. Let's see. L is seconding Michael's questioning. If online learning is the only way for you to gain an artistic education, is your Patreon suitable to become a well-rounded self-taught artist? Well, hmm. I try to make it as much as possible uh, a well-rounded education. Now that I am only one person doing it, you know, I'm going to have my own biases, just like we all do. So if you ask me, you know, uh, should I be, you know, focusing more on oil painting or more on, on drawing? Uh, I would probably ask, well, what are your goals as an artist? But then I would also say, even if your goals are to become a really great oil painter, I think that you're going to benefit from still maintaining 
a, a strong discipline in drawing. Maybe another teacher is going to say to you, you know, that, that, that actually you should spend that time oil painting instead because you've got to get used to what that material does. And the more that you get used to it, the better you're going to get at it faster. Both of those are really good arguments, by the way. You know, you can... Um, and, and, and again, I, I would subscribe to each of those being kind of good advice. You know, the, the difficulty with becoming like a well-rounded art student by studying online is probably not, and I say this, by the way, I was educated in person, so I, I didn't become educated online. Uh, uh, so I don't know that everything that's available out there. I do know that there are probably a lot of artists like myself that try to give well-rounded advice. So I think that it's very possible probably to find it in one place. I think that maybe you're you're also going to encounter some uh, some ideas out there that are maybe less than totally great and effective uh but sorry actually i kind of i was drawing and saying this i kind of digressed a little bit and i kind of lost my train of thought but uh i think my my essential answer would be yes with the caution ah i remember what i was going to say with the caution that you're only going to get as much as what your practice of those tutorials equates to so if you watch one of the videos, that does not mean that you got an education. You were introduced to an idea, and that's really cool. And that's actually really valuable. Being introduced, exposure, is it can't be understated how important it is to be exposed to these ideas. However, progressing and becoming a practicing artist, there's a key word in that, right? It's getting the practice in. So, you know, whoever you're out there studying with, whatever videos you're out there watching, you know, the important thing is what you do you know it's it's even i would say it's even a little bit less important maybe who the artist is or or even sometimes exactly the ideas that they're expressing i mean everybody's going to tell you get your proportions right like that's not going to be there's not going to be online art teachers out there that are going like ah proportions who cares uh, <laughs> so you know, once again, uh, whether it's with me or whether it's with somebody else, you're the important factor. Like you're the one that that really decides in a way what comes out of your your online or your in-person education. By the way, <laughs> you know, uh, for years I, I can remember there's always a student, uh, you know, uh, at the academy that was just there like kind of having fun. You know, they'd come to class here and there, they'd come in late, they wouldn't like kind of do their projects, you know, wouldn't kind of follow through on them. And naturally, like, even though they were at this great school paying an absolute, by the way, paying an absolute fortune. Even then, they weren't like making the progress that they should have made just because the work, the actual getting it done is what is what kind of um, is the the deciding factor in the end. I, I think we all kind of know that. I'm probably not saying anything really like, like there's like a revelation for you out there, but I just want to like say it as something that I think can empower you, which is that, that you know, you're not going to suffer, I think, from a lack of access, whether it's uh, through my Patreon or another artist's Patreon or... Uh, or even going to like a small atelier uh, school that's out there, it's probably not going to be the access to the ideas that, that gets you. It's going to be how much work and time you're able to commit to it. And, you know, this is, this is the, the real pressure point for, for students. And it's why I think, you know, it's why I believe so much in like uh, in this curriculum live thing that I'm doing is that you need the pressure to show up and do it. You know, when you're like uh, at home and you're you're kind of studying online, probably there's not someone that's like you know telling you that you need to get up and go and 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 get your your drawing done, right? Uh, most things in life, uh, even for a professional artists like myself, most things in your life are trying to do the opposite. They're trying to distract you essentially from uh, sitting down at your easel or sitting down uh, at your your drawing table. And actually getting some uh, some real work done. So you need to like master, I think that aspect of it. Uh, it's so important, so integral to your um, your your growth is is how you're able to deal with that that aspect. 
Rajarshi is asking, will you give me some tips for portraits? When I do sketching and speed, I get it right almost. But if I take time and do it slowly, I get almost 70 to 80%. Uh, well, you know, with, with portraits, I mean, I'm not sure uh, I can give like any super valuable advice that's just like a, like a tip. Uh, you know what I mean? Like that, you know, the tip would be like, um, you know, try to find a way to solve proportions before you like move on with uh, uh, the rest of the drawer and move on into value, for instance, right? You know, so that's that's an advice. That's, a, that's like a tip, I guess, technically. But in a way, you know, it's just a good practice. Like you should be doing that. That should be like most of what you're doing is just trying to get your your proportions right and to try to uh, uh, solve that at, at kind of different phases of the uh, of the project. So that's my I guess my my tip is try to maybe take your stages a little bit like uh, a la carte, right? So in the beginning, we try to solve uh, for our proportion uh, before we move on. And, and that's the other thing too is is like, don't don't just be satisfied with having tried to get your proportions, there is like essentially a pretty uh, objective truth about your proportions. You're either kind of got them right or you didn't get them right. And if you didn't get them right, you need to like erase and you need to try again to kind of get them right or or to progressively correct them until they are. Uh, so, I, you know, I, I do think that there is a, an extent to which you know, before you have a really strong sense of like standards about your drawing, where you can like kind of get a little bit satisfied with uh, with something like, you know, you go like, ah, oh, well, you know, I did I did the bit where I, I drew with straight lines. And so I, you know, I got I try I got my proportions, you know, but even for me, and like, I've been at this for a really long time. So just take it for for, for what it is. You know, even I have to work to get proportions, they don't just come, you know, and sometimes, you know, I'll get them wrong, and I need to focus really hard to make sure I get them right. Uh, so, so don't get satisfied too, too quickly. I think that's something that really sabotages uh, artists as well. In terms of, you know, coming back to this topic of like being self taught artists, as well, you know, when you are working in like a group, of really highly motivated self starters. Uh, and, and I'm saying this is usually who ends up at at like ateliers is people that are, you know, they're, they're all talented people that are coming from somewhere else, where they were the most talented person, and they're coming into this pool of people that are then are also then equally talented. So they all kind of push themselves forward, the standards for like achievement and excellence, go through the roof. Uh, so depending upon, by the way, depending on where you are, like what school or whatever, but speaking about like the Florence Academy or GCA or whatever, the the kind of group mentality of of uh, of excellence kind of pushes you forward, right? You know, um, it's like you're you're an athlete running a race, um, and instead of racing people that are really slow, you're like everybody is really, really fast at running. So you push yourself even even harder and even further. And that can be a challenging momentum to establish once again, like kind of on your own, right, as a as a self-taught artist. So and I don't really know where to kind of replicate that. Something that I try and do is to um, uh, to make like um, drawing competitions so that you have you know, uh, in a way, a reason to like compare your your skills and your prowess. And this is not, you know, to say that if you win a drawing contest, then you're great. And you're better than everybody else. Like you, I mean, you had a good day drawing, you made a good drawing, that's great. Uh, uh, and I also don't want to say like, if you don't win your drawing contest, it mean, you're a bad artist, or you're not like good at what you what you do, or you can't be good at what you do. It's just, uh, um, it's just a motivator, right? And sometimes external motivation is uh, is a good thing. You know, I think that, you know, as artists in particular, in the end, we need to be internally motivated. Uh, you need to be looking for self improvement. Uh, I think if you're if you're really gonna become an artist, because, 
you know, there's not always going to be a competition. There's always going to be like a dozen other people in your studio. And you see this actually, you see this all the time with students like leaving the academy. They leave that incubator and they leave that that external sense of motivation of like watching all the other people around them working hard and they kind of stop working so hard. And, you know, that that can definitely like affect your work. So it's not like a moral weakness. It's just, you know, I think naturally, you know, some of us are kind of competitive and, and some of us, you know, respond to a challenge that way. Like I'm actually a, uh, <laughs> I don't know if it comes across on YouTube. I'm, I'm a very competitive person, you know, like if I'm doing something, I want to try and be the absolute best at it. And, you know, it's that competition, that race that I'm usually running with myself that I kind of find most motivating, right? I'm always looking for like kind of how I can improve something. I think the difficulty within that is you can get into a mentality where you don't actually look at what's good. You don't actually, you kind of forget to look at what is working. Uh, and so you get this kind of skewed perspective about yourself, right? Where you go like, oh, nothing I do is good enough. Uh, I always need to improve. And you kind of only look at the the, the problems with, with what you're doing. Uh, you should also like get a little bit better at taking that time to understand what what is working as well and um that's actually something that environment doesn't necessarily nurture right i mean you know your teachers are there you know i'm there to to push you to say like oh this can be better you know um i try personally like as as a teacher i try a lot to uh to make sure i take the time to also you know talk about what is working in a drawing um, and some people will look at that as like, oh, you're being like nice to me or whatever. I don't want you to be nice. I want you to be like, you know, push me forward. Well, I don't know. I mean, like pushing is, it's not like one action. It's, it's, um, uh, it's also recognizing, you know, the progress that's being made as well. I think that's very important. Right. So yeah, wow, that was a really long digression. I hope all of your skulls out there are starting to kind of come along if you're drawing along with me. Uh, by the way, I wanted to mention, I thought also it could be kind of cool uh, since this is like a sketch along, like you guys have a source image, you know, uh, up on the screen, like over uh, over there. No, over there. Um, that if you post it on the community section, my YouTube, like post your, your, uh, your drawing or your study there uh, when we get done. If you know where the community tab is. If not, what are you going to do? So let's see, Marion de Jong is uh, asking, I've recently done an anatomy course. How important is it in your opinion to learn the names of the bones? Just learn the names. The, uh, I think it's, it's actually uh, terribly important. And uh, I think that for me, uh, it was a, it's one of the most kind of useful things about studying anatomy. Now, it can be done without it. And I've actually been asked this question. I was talking with, um, I was doing a, a, did a kind of video series with Stan Prokopenko and we were actually talking about exactly this question. He was saying, well, but do you think you can, you know, can you kind of draw anatomy without really like talking about anatomy without like saying like, oh, I know the name is yada, yada, yada. Yeah, for sure you can. It's not, it's not that you can't do that, but I think that if you're really, putting learning anatomy at like the forefront of your goals, I almost think like you need to consciously make an effort to not learn them. I mean, there's uh, like everywhere where you're going to interact with, uh, you know, an anatomical education, the person putting together that content is probably going to be using the names of the muscles. They're probably going to be talking about it in no uncertain terms. And so I think the information is like already right there in front of you. So I would say just, you know, just embrace that that part of it, because eventually I think learning the names. And again, this comes down to, you know, what we all have to be as artists is we have to be in that sense, like a little bit self-motivated and self-confident. You know, that is a great resource in terms of like really feeling like, well, I get it. Like, I know I get it because I know the, the theory around it. I can, I can explain it. Like, you've all heard that kind of Einstein quote, right? If you can't explain it, then you don't understand it. 
And so if you try to explain anatomy, uh, I think those names are going to become very important. And so I say, you know, just uh, take it as part of the process and run with it uh, because eventually I think you're going to be very happy that you did. I do also say that all this for, for artists a lot. You know, the, the question comes up about like how to be a professional, like how do you earn, earn a living as an artist? I know as a representational painter, uh, learning hard skills can be a really great benefit moving forward, right? So uh, when I was a student, uh, I studied anatomy quite a bit. And as a consequence, you know, I was a better workshop teacher. Like I'd travel around the world and teach workshops in uh, New York, California, wherever. And because I had that, that foundation, you know, that was something I could say, you know, to the people running these studios and these schools that are, that are hosting workshops. So yeah, we're going to talk about anatomy, structure, skull, et cetera, how that all relates to portraiture. You know, it makes you, I think, a better professional when you, when you know things like at that level. That might not be a priority for you, you know, and so, you know, to that extent, yeah, I mean, like you can, there's plenty of people out there drawing great uh, drawings that aren't going to be able to talk to you about the anatomy. They're not going to be able to engage with it on that level. And that's totally cool. But like I said, in like a perfect world, I think that you're doing yourself a really big favor to, um, uh, to actually learn in, in that way. Hope that helps. I hope all of this helps, by the way. This is just like, you know, I mean, you really probably want to get like opinions from a lot of different people about this stuff, you know, and kind of cross reference. You know, it's your job as a student to be like a critical thinker about things, right? That doesn't mean like to to always just be like uh, to doubt everything and go, oh, I, you know, I don't believe whatever, uh, or to be like obnoxious about it when you're you're working with people. I'm not talking about me here, but like you know, when you do interact with other teachers that you're learning from. Uh, being a critical thinker doesn't mean that that you have to be a pain, <laughs> uh, but uh, I think just kind of assessing uh, each uh, each notion that is introduced, and uh, and always remembering to kind of ask why about something. Why is like the most important thing that I think you can ask as a, as an art student because you know you need to be able to make the choice yourself when and whether to do something. And if you don't have that capacity, then I think you're going to be having a very difficult time when you're, again, like self-assessing, when you're working on your own, which is really, uh, eventually, that's the end game here. That's what this is all about. You don't want to be working with a teacher for like the rest of your life, uh, you know, however fun that might, uh, that might be, uh, depending upon the teacher, you know, you want to become autonomous. That's where you want to be. Um, and eventually, maybe you want to, to teach stuff as well. Like I said, in terms of like earning a living, you know, a lot of artists that I know, and, and I mean, I'm talking artists that are showing properly at galleries, doing solo shows, stuff like that. They're still out there like teaching workshops and things, uh, you know, because making a living at, as an artist is usually a matter of doing many different things, uh, not just doing kind of one thing. So that's my advice about that. Wow. Yeah. So huge digression here. Uh, let's see. The progenitor is asking, do you have a specific approach to quick sketches duration of two to five minutes or 10 minutes? Uh, for example, taking notes at a workshop. That's, a, that's an interesting one, you know, and sketching actually is something, I think it's so valuable. I think it's so great for people to become attuned to that ability. It's actually not something that was really highly emphasized when I was a student. And so uh, I had to like post graduate, I had to kind of figure out where I fit in in terms of sketching, right? Like, uh, just I had to kind of figure out what, um, what to do about that. Uh, and so eventually, I think I, I prize it a lot. I think sketching is such a valuable uh, discipline. Uh, in terms of like a technical approach to sketching, I have done like a quick sketch tutorial, but it was still maybe focused on on like sketching a portrait in the studio environment. So not exactly what you're asking about. You're saying, you know, if you're at a workshop, like taking notes, 
I think that the best kind of broad advice I could give about that would just be to, uh, in a way, draw quite independent of, um, of like the visual impression, right? Which is to say, like, when we're squinting down and we're like assessing values and things, uh, you know, quick sketching is unlikely to be a um, highly specific form of drawing in terms of its value expression. Uh, so you're really working with super simplified values, but not only that, I would I would say that you're, uh, you're working probably a lot more with uh, a kind of a linear definition of things rather than like a value-based definition of things, right? Uh, mass drawing like seems like it would be a great way to kind of quick sketch, but I think if value is the primary expression you're drawing, uh, value actually just takes time when you draw. It takes time to kind of build up value. Uh, we all know that if we're, you know, if we've worked analog, you know, I mean, um, it's one of the reasons why, you know, oil painting and charcoal are these kind of prized mediums because it's still drawing, or sorry, ra rather charcoal is still drawing, but um, but the immediacy of the value you're able to express in them is uh, uh, is something that uh, eventually is very is very useful. So I hope that that helps. I know it's not uh, exactly like a um, a fully fleshed out kind of answer uh, in terms of how to to sketch quickly, but you know part of it too is you just want to allow your your pencil to uh, to be a kind of a searching entity. You know, again, quick sketching isn't so much about executing; it's about searching. And if you're not used to like searching with your pencil. It can be a little bit of a it can be a little bit of an awkward transition, right? Because we're used to like uh, like I said, for instance, for me, you know, when I started drawing, it was all like seventy five hour drawings, you know, just like really long form stuff, and you know, working with uh, a lot of time and a lot of detail eventually. So not really suited to applying those those techniques uh, to, to quick sketching. And it is a different discipline. And that's maybe the thing that I can impress upon you here is that, you know, because you can draw actually doesn't mean that you can sketch. Um, or, or at the very least that, that it, it's not a, uh, um, it doesn't mean that you have already learned to sketch just because you can do a long form drawing. Uh, they are uh, subtly different disciplines and they're going to require subtly different um, skill sets. So there you go. Uh, let's see. Whew, sorry, I've been talking for a while now. Um, I don't know how long we've been like on yet, but uh, my voice is getting a little bit tired. I'm going to take a drink of water. James, uh, Jamie Gertler is saying, uh, your demeanor for responses to this chat is impeccable. Thank you for being here and sharing this with us. Uh, so happy I'm not the only person who's uh, dabbling in digital art that only uses one layer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm a dabbler. It's true. Uh, so, uh, Sud Hanshu is asking, when will you upload the tutorial on YouTube for graphite and charcoal? I'm not sure that I have a tutorial in graphite and charcoal. Um, if there's one that you're thinking of in particular, just let me know and uh, I'll see about... Um, uh, uploading it onto YouTube. Usually most, well, actually not usually, but all the time when I make a tutorial, I usually make like a free version of it for YouTube as well. Um, and if you're actually looking for one in particular that you haven't been able to find, uh, you want to go to my navigation website, which is stephenbaumanartwork.com. If you go there, there's like a really easy thumbnail access to like all of the tutorials that are that I have out. Um, uh, because the Patreon site is a little bit difficult to to kind of navigate. And, and the same with YouTube, you know, like if, if, if it's not a video I released recently, you know, it's going to be kind of like uh, uh, down the, uh, the scroll, so to speak, right? Um, so if you go there, you can, like I said, you can find all the free versions of stuff too. So uh, yeah, give a, give a look there and then get back to me if you still, uh, if you still can't find it. Uh, let's see. Andy Rodriguez, hey Andy, how you doing? Uh, says, love the stream, keep it up, just here for the convo. Uh, maybe name drop a few artists that inspire you. Ooh, 
you know, there's there's uh, this and this is a cool one, like living and dead. I mean, I, I follow a lot of people on Instagram, which, by the way, uh, if you're an artist and you don't have an Instagram account, uh, just do yourself a favor. Go make one today because all the artists that you're into, <laughs> like all the artists that you admire are already on Instagram and uh, you can kind of find them all there. I'm sure that all of you like what with the age demographic of a YouTube your average YouTube watcher, I'm sure all of you are on Instagram. Uh, so I'm not really saying anything you don't already know. Um, but like artists that inspire me, you know, uh, I'm continually inspired by uh, um, Amaya Grapita. I think she's just fantastic. Um, had the pleasure to uh, work with her at the FAA in, in, uh, in Jersey City for, uh, for, for, for four years. And that's a long time, eh? But um, I didn't kind of realize until I just said it. But uh, but yeah, so I worked together with her for four years. Uh, my wife, Cornelia, you know, is always making amazing work. And I'm lucky enough to, uh, you know, be in the same studio, essentially, with her uh, making that work. So um, uh, always an inspiration there as well. Uh, other artists that I think are... T oh, hey, this is one. And it's... Here's the thing about this one. It's probably not going to be like the artist that you expect because aesthetically, I think it's uh, it's going to be so different from what I actually do, you know. And this is the thing about for me about like artists that I appreciate. It's not always just artists that are doing literally the exact same thing that I'm doing, you know. I uh, I sometimes and I, I would I would hope that really this is the case for everybody that. You know, sometimes your your appreciation goes quite far outside of your your own kind of comfort zone, right? Your own uh, kind of echo chamber. But there's an artist called Rupert Kaufman, uh, who is just he just knocks my socks off literally every time I see one of his works, uh, and uh, it's all you know, kind of high concept stuff. It's not. Like the representational aspect of it isn't really what you're you're there for. And that's why I say like you know it might be like if you go and look this guy up today, you might go like, huh? Like I don't get I don't get it. Why is Stephen who does like all this like really super, uh, just realistic like traditional looking realism? You know why is he like uh, talking about this this artist in particular? Uh, you know I just find that his work is so incredibly evocative uh, and. Um, and I'm just always really kind of moved and stimulated by it. It's it's in my opinion, I think, and I wonder what he would have to say about this. In my opinion, I would say it's like it's very intellectual work. It's uh, it's work that uh, stimulates the uh, the mind and the imagination, um, rather than being strictly speaking like uh, emotionally interesting work. Which is to say, like a lot of like Baroque art that uh, maybe was a part of my education, you know, Rembrandt and Caravaggio and, and all this. These are artists that are like appealing to your, uh, your, your heart, right? They're appealing to your emotion. They are, um, you know, they're, uh, 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 you know, announcing the, 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 the feelings, right? Um, and I think probably there's, there's an extent of that in, in Rupert's work as well. But uh, also, I, I find it highly intellectually stimulating. So um, interesting question there, like just in terms of like who who inspires you. I think he inspires me a lot, even even if, again, I'm not really making work uh, that 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 looks like that. Um, and I would encourage all of you to kind of just get on board with that idea as well, that, um, you know, you can really get into a lot of artists out there. Uh, even if they're not necessarily like within your genre. Uh, I think that kind of gives you a bit more of a broad perspective about things, um, you know, that can be helpful, like, you know, when you're... Because eventually, you know, you do want to be able to appreciate things, you know? Like, I remember there was this kind of attitude around the academy, probably still is in a way, like in a lot of uh, academic circles, you probably find this, so it's not like, you know, calling out a couple art academies for doing this is not you know, it's not going to be news to anybody. But, you know, there's this kind of insular idea that what we do is is the good thing. And so we only like people that do kind of what we do. And that's cool, because you kind of, it can be helpful as a student to look at things like that for a while, because you get like, so such like laser focus 
on on what what you're trying to learn uh, rather than you know like trying to hear like a dozen different voices and a dozen different kind of artistic um, uh, uh, directions or paths you know you instead you kind of focus on one uh, so in that to that extent it can be really good for you but I think in the future like as a human <laughs> which you know we all are you know first humans uh, second artists uh, you know I think it's it's valuable to be able to appreciate things on on different levels yeah so that is um, that is my opinion about that one let's see uh, okay so a lot more questions um, Warren ING is asking, was the Art Florence curriculum in English or Italian? Uh, interesting question. Yeah, it was, uh, it was in English. Um, and actually, we rather rarely had uh, an Italian uh, speaking student. Uh, it did happen a few times over the years, but not, uh, not really so often. Um, certainly not as often as you would, uh, you would think with the school being in Italy. By the way, how, how long are we into the stream? I have no idea whatsoever what uh, what time it is. Uh, so we were about an, about an hour and a half in. Um, I think that other responsibilities are going to eventually uh, mean that I need to get out of here. Uh, but I want to get try and get a couple teeth on this guy uh, before I go. So let's see if I can uh, just dial into that uh, really quick. Um, which is probably a bad recipe for uh, drawing something um, with that level of detail. But I'm going to try it anyway. Hopefully all of you out there are confronting the teeth uh, already as well. you got to get there sometime. This is going to be like the quietest moment of the stream because i got to like focus on all these like little individual like tooth sections there's this little like this is kind of like arcing gesture this way but it's not like a like a like a regular a regular arc you know it's like it's got different kind of um goes up and down a little bit so you gotta be kind of careful that you don't just create the arc that you want to create <laughs> you gotta like look for the one that's actually there All right. Yeah, you know, this is, uh, there's more that I wanted to do here. Uh, like, you know, looking down at the mandible, you know, there's a lot of, um, a lot of work I'm gonna have to do in that, uh, in that respect to kind of get to where I'm, I'm trying to go. Oh yeah, so yeah, sorry. Questions. I got I got hung up on all those uh, uh, teeth. Um, let's see. Uh, Leanne Janes is asking any tips on finishing an artwork faster. I'm a high school art student right now, and being a perfectionist always gets in the way of turning uh, plates earlier. Well, you know the thing about that is, um, you know I I'm a little bit of a perfectionist as well. I would recommend that you try to give yourself essentially like a uh, a deadline if you if you give yourself all the time in the world then you'll always kind of take all the time in the world if you uh if you set yourself a little bit of a deadline you have a much greater kind of possibility of just uh shutting it off and and getting done with what you, what you got to get done with uh so deadlines are important in that respect sometimes they come like artificially sometimes they come because they uh, uh you know they're um, imposed by you so that's what I would recommend. Uh, let's see. Uh, whew, questions, questions, questions. Uh, someone has a burning question about what happened to Florence Academy in New Jersey. You and three of the top artists left there around the same time. Was it a coincidence? Was it a strike? Was it a disagreement? <laughs> that is a great question. And uh, I'm not sure that uh, this is the venue in which I will answer that. Um, it was not at all a coincidence. Uh, I can say that. So um, I'm just going to leave that where it is. 
uh, and maybe uh, maybe sometime when it's the right time, uh, the uh, story of uh, of that will um, will all come out. Yeah. So that's I'm sure very mysterious, and will do nothing to stop you from being uh, curious about uh, about what happened there. Right. So. Uh, Michael Gring is asking, Stephen, on Patreon, does the $10 tier cover the block-in stage? Uh, same as the $5 tier. Absolutely, uh, yeah, it does. If you subscribe at the $10 level, then you have access to literally everything on the site, including, and again, this is what I'm really excited about right now, is the Curriculum Live uh, uh, option. So I'm doing a series of like live workshops in which I'm kind of detailing uh, at the moment, focusing on uh, drawing foundations, right? So uh, the essential things that you need to know uh, at the beginning of your kind of drawing education, because I think that there are certainly, um, you know, a lot of options in terms of like more advanced tutorials on my site, but I want to make sure that I kind of service that that need, which is probably where, where most people are at. Uh, where you need actually just to figure out uh, how to start, like what are the basics? How do I get to a level where you know my drawings make make some kind of sense, right? And then I can kind of I can start to use even more the advanced stuff. So uh, curriculum live is what to look out for, and you definitely have access to that if you subscribe at the ten dollar level. So uh, and on top of that, of course, you get all the other like whatever. 180 hours worth of like uh, tutorial content as well. So um, a lot of stuff that you get for a small price. Let's see. Uh, right. Yikes McKee is asking, I'm starting my Rembrandt master copy as a beginner. I'm feeling a bit overwhelmed. Any tips? Uh, my tip about that would actually be that you'd probably stand to benefit a lot from actually doing some studies. So you know, let's say you were like, you know, even drawing this skull, you know, just starting out and, um, you know, and just trying to get a feeling for like what the overall shape of it should uh, should be by doing some some like sketches on the side. I think that's the place where I'm always going to when I feel like, you know, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to be doing. It's always going to be a matter of like doing some sketches and studies to kind of get into the project. And even and this is the other thing, too, is that doesn't have to stop once you've like started the drawing, you know, you can, if you're confused about an area, you can always go through and uh, like do a sketch of that area, like a smaller drawing of that area that helps you understand what's going on there. Because what you need to do is basically engage also your your kind of visual memory. And Loomis is great in kind of talking about this, and that he, that he uh, unequivocally states that that when you're drawing, really, it is also like a memory exercise. So it's not just about like looking at stuff uh, and, and drawing it. You're also uh, engaged in trying to memorize it. So the ability that you have, the capacity that you have to memorize something is important. And the way to strengthen that is through having a deeper knowledge of something, uh, not just looking at it more, but, but gaining insight um, uh, about what that subject is, right? Uh, so, you know, knowing more about that, knowing anatomy, is one way to like uh, increase your sense of like uh, or your capacity to to kind of memorize um, uh, the human form. So that is what I would recommend: is do some small studies and sketches on the side. Um, but I think actually the time that I have to spend uh, here on this drawing is up. So I think I've got to run um, as much as I. I'm actually really still enjoying this. Uh, there is uh, other things going on that uh, probably require some attention. So uh, I'm just going to have to say thank you to everybody here. And um, let me just switch cameras to the other camera so I can do a kind of goodbye bit, right? <laughs> Let's see. All right, so listen, I just want to say thank you so much, everybody, to watching. It's been like an hour and a half that we've been doing this. I hope your sketches came out fantastic. Remember, if you want to, if you can find the community tab on my YouTube page, uh, you can post there and I'll shoot your comment or something about your, your drawing. And if you are interested in like really in-depth tutorials and stuff like that, and if you're interested in Curriculum Live, which is something I'm really excited about sharing with uh, all of my online students, uh, you can go to my Patreon page. Uh, that's 
uh, patreon.com slash Stephen Bauman artwork. There'll even be a link that will eventually pop up on, on one side or the other here uh, that will take you right there and you can subscribe for a very small amount and get access to tons of stuff. Uh, but once again, thank you so much for being here and uh, take it easy, all right?